Hello Ooh. and welcome back on the x hind stage at this very strange RC3, now on the second day. And our next talk is by Aprika and Saad, um, who are going to talk about how to add critical making to your uh, critical thinking to your making. And there was a talk uh, two years ago at 50, 35 C3, when we're still able to meet in person, which was already talking about the subject. And this now kind of is a follow up. And they're going to talk about what we can learn from critical makers and other grassroots initiatives. Um, yes, the stage is yours. Ah, thank you, Carl. Thank you so much for hosting us uh, here under the tree in Ixhain. <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> so um, great to be here and uh, great to have you all uh, yeah, watching in the stream. And uh, I hope next year we will meet under trees again and uh, also not under trees in the, at the rocket. Um, so I'm Aprika. I'm part of the Global Innovation Gathering, a uh, big worldwide community that I often describe as the global uh, ERFA, which uh, most of CCC folks would know as uh, Erfahrungsaustauschkreis, so knowledge sharing and uh, uh, circle. And so we are also a knowledge sharing circle and I'm joined by Saad, um, who's one of the amazing members uh, of the association and of the network of GIG uh, from Singapore. And do you want to quickly introduce yourself as well? Sure thing. Um, I'm based in Singapore normally. And um, yeah, last year we had a little talk about uh, with Regina and uh, on critical thinking and critical making which was actually quite phenomenal. The response um, was really great. And we've had a chance to work on this together with the other gig members, uh, members of the Global Innovation Gathering, of which Sandra is also a part. So I'm very happy to be with you. Uh, a little bit of my background. I'm a tech person. I run a small startup in Singapore. And um, I also help with Makerspaces and uh, Tech for Good. And I'm a huge coffee snob. Uh, That, that's me. Other people would call it coffee geek. <laughs> <laughs> that works too. Ah, nice. So I, I think some people now in the stream also see our slides and um, we're on the first slide and on the second slide you would see um, a picture of an actual stage and an actual congress. <laughs> <laughs> where um, Regina and uh, Saad last year defined um, critical making, um, the topic we're also uh, two years ago. It's basically yesterday, uh, like pre-pandemic, but it's also 100 years ago, right? So last time <laughs> you spoke about the topic, uh, you defined it as adding uh, critical thinking to the making. And so we arrive at uh, critical making. And I guess there is like 200 other um, definitions of this. Uh, which one did you share, Saad? Making with a purpose, I think, is the one that fits the best. Um, the idea that, you know, the skills and, and uh, experience and knowledge that you have uh, being applied towards something that is constructive and meaningful. And that means very different things to very different people. So uh, depending on the context that you're in, the definition changes quite dramatically. But, you know, sort of digging down into it, to making with a purpose, understanding what that purpose is. Uh, rather than just using your 3D printer for printing Yoda heads all the time, um, you think about you know how this could actually help people uh, with customization, personalization, things like that. So that's the that's the sort of thing that uh, definition that I prefer to making with a purpose. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, certainly one of the yeah very easy to understand ones also um it's also a very academic concept and so everybody who's interested in this uh, whole concept and all, in all the different um, areas of critical making we highly recommend or i highly recommend because sad was speaking this 
Uh, I highly recommend um, to watch the talk by Regina and Saad. It's like one hour long and it will give a very comprehensive uh, and also academic viewpoint um, of the topic. And uh, today I think we, we focus more on what happened since then and what's beyond um, just the, or not just uh, beyond the concept. So to go to the third slide, um, you see um, this is uh, one of the pictures uh, also shared in the talk back then of the global innovation gathering um, when we also were still gathering um, physically um, with the big blue um, mobile lab. And um, I would love to uh, go like for two minutes into what happened since uh, we gathered the last time. So what happened uh, during the pandemic in terms of uh, how how did critical making evolve uh, in public perception uh, during the time of the pandemic? Sad, what would you say? Well, I think we've seen a phenomenal uh, response, a global response um, from makers to meet the needs of uh, what the pandemic has surfaced. I mean, the, um, I think there's a phenomenal potential here uh, in the nature of this response. Um, but if we remember about a year or so ago, and I know time is broken because of COVID, but about a year or so ago, there was the shortage of personal protective equipment, PPE, and um, people came forward in order to try and help. And it wasn't just healthcare workers, it wasn't just um, social workers, it was anybody and everybody who had skills or knowledge or experience um, tried to find a way to make themselves useful. And um, this happening on a global scale in response to something like the personal shortage of PPE um, drew out a, a lot of critical makers, as in, makers who were quite comfortable with how 3D printers work or how maker spaces work and trying to apply that to a social need, which I think um, is remarkable in and of itself, but on a global scale, I think that's, that that potential is phenomenal there. All of us have had to find ways to you know, adapt digitally and go online and do things remotely. And I really miss having a CCC in person, for example, and the global uh, innovation gathering hasn't happened in person. Um, so I really do miss that. And I'm looking forward to a time where we're able to meet in person again, um, trying to stay optimistic. But um, we, we're still not out of it yet. Uh, the pandemic is still very much um, something we're adapting to, something that we're responding to. And um, to answer your question, what's changed, I feel, is that people are now more involved. People who are normally sort of in their own maker spaces bubble or in their tech bubble or in their hacker space bubble are now more involved and more engaged and recognized uh, for the skills to be relevant to a social cause. So I think moving forward, um, I would like to see us try and tap on that potential as much as possible. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, the, the space we're in at the moment, um, the Exxon uh, hack and make space was like at the forefront um, together with, of course, many other um, spaces in Germany to pr produce such uh, protective equipment. And, and if, if you see around around us now, uh, you also see like lots of figurines of, uh, I don't know, Yoda hats, for example, and many other things that bring joy uh, to making as well. And that, for example, help to educate about um, which tools to use, um, for example. And then, yeah, looking in uh, what you're doing in Singapore um, with creating um, toys for children with disabilities, um, what you're also sharing in the talk two years ago, um, where they can interact with like big buttons instead of like tiny, um, tiny things that they can't really touch and interact with. Um, that's also bringing lots of joy. And it's not only, uh, always, uh, to counter a pandemic, but it was there before. And, um, now I think it's very, yeah, more in mainstream. Well, it was uh, for a time um, more arriving in mainstream uh, that this is really, yeah, 
a movement or movements um, to follow and to uh, contribute to as well. Uh, so what, what we often do, uh, and this is the next slide, is we create a Horizon 2020 proposal for uh, things we want to do. Um, and so this is my work actually uh, to, um, yeah, bring in um, funding that lasts us for two and a half years, for example, in this case, uh, to really further research, uh, to collaborate with researchers as a civil society organization ourselves, and to uh, be able to work together globally uh, on a specific um, project uh, and an, on a specific uh, topic. So in the craziness of uh, the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we found that critical making is the one topic that is not very researched and that we can contribute to as a network and also um, connecting with Regina as part of the TU Berlin um, and other organizations that you see here with Wikifactory, um, that's a global platform for makers uh, to share designs, for example, and to find a community of other designers and makers and the Center for Social Innovation in uh, Austria and also VTT in Finland. So um, we produced this uh, project together that got um, finally um, accepted by the European Union, which was really nice. And so we're now thankful for um, getting uh, support for the research we're doing now um, in critical making. So this was after after Congress uh, that we wrote this. Um, and the, the main goal, and uh, you see this on the next slide, um, is to help make a communities uh, to work with anyone uh, to contribute to open source innovation. And so from these very complex like research frameworks um, that uh, um, Horizon 2020 is uh, using, like the responsible research and innovation framework and others, we found that it connects very well with um, values um, that also we want to um, further uh, contribute to like openness, like inclusion. Um, and so we selected uh, a few of those. Uh, we selected uh, gender diversity. We selected uh, young talents, we call it, uh, because in such proposals, you often have to um, yeah, use language um, that speaks to the funder. Um, and we also selected uh, openness uh, as a very broad um, term also to research on. And um, today um, I would like to show you a little bit of what's already happened because we're now at the end of the first year of the project and um, show you a bit uh, what we're up to as well. Um, so to just give you a very tiny glimpse into what we did in the gender um, work package, um, we work with uh, different spaces, uh, different makers um, in uh, several countries. Uh, and in this case, uh, I brought uh, two examples uh, of case studies um, that will be published soon about different uh, spaces. The one is Miss Balthasar Laboratory in Austria, which I highly recommend uh, to check out. And um, then there were like many different more and also Exxon. And of course, I need to show that here as we are in Exxon at the moment. <laughs> and uh, this is super nice uh, because um, of course, um, if you like think about gender, many people would assume it's only about like inclusion of uh, women, of uh, girls in makerspaces. But of course it's not. It's like to have um, an understanding of uh, the multitude of genders and also like, yeah, to, to include everyone, uh, also have a nice space for uh, people identifying as uh, male, um, female, and um, many other um, genders. And in this case, um, it's just so nice also about Ixan that they are not saying like, we are space for women or we are space for uh, only for a specific kind of nerd, um, but we want to be very very inclusive and uh, very safe for everyone. Uh, so that's just a very tiny examples. You will find um, online more uh, in our 
deliverables. We call that, uh, yeah, the reports um, that we have to hand in to the European Union and that we then, after handing them in, uh, we take snippets out of these uh, and publish them in a more like human interaction format um, that people outside of academia um, can also read better and watch better. Um, then the next one uh, you see in slide nine um, is uh, Young Talents, which we may basically make about maker education for young people. And there um, you already find online, and that's the next slide, um, the review of measures to integrate young people into maker community. And there we looked mostly um, only at Germany at the moment and want to be um, creating this uh, for other countries as well. So if you're interested um, in this part of the project, uh, you can already download like the full report, uh, the first one, uh, but you can also reach out to us uh, and uh, contribute to the next steps. Mm. And then the part um, in the next slide is openness, um, which is the one that I want to be talking a little bit more about um, because uh, that's the one um, where we're mostly working together here um, on. So for openness, uh, you see in the next slide, there was some uh, academic article now published, which is a literature review um, on the openness practices um, and which is like very directed for researchers, of course, um, but um, we're also um, starting to make, um, yeah, like talks like this uh, about what was found out um, by our colleagues who were doing um, the li literature review. So in the next slide, you see um, a little bit more accessible. Um, what they found is um, that openness, as probably all of you also know, um, is one of the core values of uh, global maker movements. Um, but as you probably also all know, um, there are lots and lots of different interpretations uh, and ways of practicing this. So we can speak about open hardware, um, which is probably one of the most obvious for many of um, the people just watching this, uh, because it's also something uh, we speak at Chaos Congress uh, all the time. Um, so, um, like sharing uh, what you're making um, in like open repositories, for example, uh, creating very easy um, tech, like frugal tech, um, customizing things. So that's all um, integral part of open hardware, I would say. Um, and then uh, we found other aspects that are strong in the literature as well, like Openness um, can also be understood as uh, inclusion and empowerment of, um, for example, of people with disabilities, but also um, generally uh, consumers or um, ethnic minorities. So all different kinds of inclusions um, that uh, one could think of uh, is very like one of the core things, I think also as like hacker ethics is concerned, but um, um, that is maybe not always in, in our minds. And then also um, very important economic growth, especially if we look at uh, the um, yeah global scale of the maker movement. So um, that we have uh, open business models, for example, and um, high innovation activities in in the field. And so um, this already shows also um, lots of tension. So I would like to go to the next slide where you see um, the tensions identified in the scientific literature. Um, so there's lots of tension between different economic stances, like people who want to have uh, their maker practice uh, 
mostly for uh, leisure purposes, mostly for um, also uncapitalistic uh, or, or anti-capitalistic purposes. Um, so this is quite uh, an important uh, tension to identify and also to, to work around. Um, then tensions arising from different imaginaries of the future role of making, like do you use it in a revolutionary sense uh, or in a, a sense that uh, contributes to the current status of um, the capitalist system, for example. And then also, of course, always, uh, but that's maybe uh, the least uh, <laughs> important finding uh, between individual and collective orientations, um, where um, you often um, have like, what do I do and what is good for society is um, yeah, something that's always important to, to go forward with uh, as, as a discussion. Yeah, so these are the scientific findings um, from this article. Oh, not, not all of them, of course. Please read the article also. <laughs> There's more in it. Um, and um, do, do you want to add something, Sad? Because uh, you, you, you will bring more examples of these uh, different tensions, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, my perspective is always the sort of hands-on um, learning by example kind of approach for the more academic perspective. I turn to Regina and people who are uh, with the academic community. So I, want, uh, I can't really speak to that perspective, but um, to add to what you've already said, I think um, the, the nature of the work, uh, at least from my perspective, being all hands-on uh, does uh, meet a lot of resistance um, with these restrictions of, you know, with the whole pandemic situation. Um, so I'm hoping that um, we're going to see more examples of people coming forward uh, with a, a more constructive mindset and um, the ability to share, because we've seen examples of this in response to the pandemic. Um, and some of that is now starting to show up in people's mindset. And when people are, who are normally uh, not so engaged, uh, engineering good where I volunteer is depends entirely on volunteers. And sometimes people show up like once a week, once uh, one weekend a month to volunteer. And then, you know, they go back and to their day to day lives and we see them every now and again when they have the time. Um, but in the last few, uh, in the recent past, we've seen a different kind of volunteer, a different kind of mindset that they bring to their work. And it seems um, a little bit more motivated, I feel. Uh, and so the work that we've been doing in the past, this idea of being open and to share and to be able to look into other people's work and try and replicate it, um, that aspect is starting to, to, to be more welcomed by these volunteers. It's not seen as an alien idea. It's not like you have to sort of like workshop it and get people comfortable with this idea. Um, and in Asian cultures, that more of that is necessary, I feel. Um, but uh, the, the remarkable difference, I think, um, I don't know if this is just me, but from what I've seen, uh, the mindset has shifted and people are more open to trying new things and also sharing what they've tried rather than waiting until they get to a point where something works and then they share it. So the process of, of um, that they are going through is something that you don't, at least with Asian sensibilities, you tend not to share it. You would think that it's not good enough or uh, it's not fully formed yet. So you tend to keep it to yourself or just the few people that you're working with and it never gets documented, it never gets shared um but yeah. i'm starting to see more examples of that yeah i think that's not only asian uh <laughs> asian problem <laughs> but we have it like uh, everywhere that uh, you have so many pro projects uh or like pro 
products um, that people create that are like prototypes uh, to a certain stage and then uh, you either uh, don't have time for it anymore or you just feel like you can't finish it and it never gets documented. So um, that's also one of the the issues uh, we found and ad identified uh, when we met in 2019 um, in uh, Kenya, in Nakuru, um, with uh, the Global Innovation Gathering in a, like, uh, work workshop uh, kind of conference. And we came up with uh, what is shared on the next slide, um, the principles of sustainable making. And uh, sustainable is here not only environmentally, but also what you would call maybe responsible or with purpose. Uh, so um, do you want to share a little bit more about that? Well, the process behind this was um, mind boggling to me. The sort of energy that was in the room at the time when we were discussing this was sort of, for me at least, very hard to keep up with. Um, and the challenge was to try and encapsulate what the, the, the sort of very diverse perspectives that were coming in um, all at the same time. Because with the Global Innovation Gathering and many other groups uh, of that sort, there's a lot of diversity. And uh, the nature of the people who are working on uh, maker spaces and uh, co-working spaces or uh, startup enterprise type of uh, ecosystems or hacker spaces, they're very socially engaged. And it tends to be in response to the local environment in which they exist. So the learnings and the sort of uh, mindset that um, they have have and they bring to this this uh, particular uh, topic that we're talking about uh, unlocked a whole world of, uh, of, of of opinions and perspectives and all of that was flooding in into this room uh, um, after having gone, gone through the sort of ice breaking thing it was all just pouring in and it was very difficult to sort of sort out what was happening um, so the process was a mess and if you look at the image uh now it, it's very neat and clean and tidy but i feel every single aspect of what's being portrayed here is a representation of um uh, this diversity uh in an international on a global scale and all of this was uh, just before the pandemic um and you know the idea of this of this global perspective um bringing it through um times of crisis, uh, I think is is phenomenal. Um, I, I mean, I could go on and on about it, but uh, that's just what I think at the moment. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, I, I also feel it's uh, phenomenal. And uh, we try to replicate these kind of, um, yeah, sessions and workshops uh, online and to have big whiteboards uh, together. But uh, yeah, I'm very happy that uh, we also got to build this still uh, in person. And so we came up with these five principles of uh, integrate local knowledge, um, of make things that make sense, of share how you make, like that's uh, one of the openness factors, of course, build for continuity and also uh, include ecosystem services. So look around you and uh, look what's already there uh, and also contribute back um, to what's around you. Um, and based on these uh, and what we already talked about in critical making, um, we built um, this uh, project and uh, while I was uh, away for three months uh, and uh, didn't look at any email and uh, uh, recharged uh, this year, um, the project team also uh, updated uh, this for our project uh, so um, that we uh, now look at uh, being uh, local and connected, um, have like a social um, background in what you're doing, um, add the criticality, so be... Uh, reflexive, um, have um, an impact and uh, change structures and adding to it uh, the joyful and meaningful that we didn't found in our principles back then, which is, we of course always think that's part of it, hopefully. <laughs> so adding some glitter is always necessary. Um, 
So this um, from that slide is uh, what we're now working with um, in the critical making um, principles, basically. And where we are um, also building upon it uh, in the next steps of the project. So I would like to share uh, what we're now working on uh, in the next uh, few months, uh, which is uh, on the next slide, um, the critical making mentoring program. Um, which is to be starting um, to have an open call um, in uh, January or early February, and then uh, we'll go through uh, for will go on for the whole year. So on the next slide, you see why are we doing this? Uh, we did like a small survey uh, within our own uh, circles, um, and again. Um, found that uh, openness also for everybody in the um, global innovation gathering community is a very important value, which we knew, but it's nice to, to see it again. Um, and then also the economic opportunities of making um, are very important. So we're thinking about uh, lower income countries sometimes, but also if you look at high income countries, uh, there's so many um, uh, volunteer projects, um, like projects you're doing in your free time that in the end, you would like to find somehow a way to uh, further work on them uh, than what is possible um, without uh, any like economic uh, background uh, to add to it. Um, and then also um, inclusion uh, was recognized again as an important um, topic, like uh, including, for example, people with lower technical skills um, and also, um, for example, having uh, making more accessible for people with disabilities. So we're looking at that. Um, and on the next slide, uh, you see I'm trying to live up to the value of sharing early uh, uh, like one of those uh, online mind boards of um, whiteboards um, of seeing um, what we want to be doing uh, in the year in this project um, where we're having uh, mentoring workshops um, throughout uh, the summer and we will hopefully uh, in the end have an amazing uh, demo week or demo day um, where we also give um, a reward for people who participated um, and we're still in this um, last phase of uh, co-designing that program um, to prepare um, the open call. So I'm inviting you <laughs> who are watching now uh, already to watch our space to um, maybe um, uh, apply for um, the program or share it um, also with others uh, who could be interested in it. Um, and uh, last but not least, I would like to share a few um, tools and resources we're currently uh, assembling. So one of the things um, we're uh, preparing for the next uh, two months, I think, is toolkits uh, for researchers and for makers. Um, and you see on the next slide, one example of a tool for makers um, to learn about open hardware and uh, I hope you all know this already, but if not, uh, check out this uh, Open Hardware Makers program. Uh, it's an amazing um, resource uh, to learn like uh, the basics of um, open hardware. Um, we collected, you see on the next slide, um, lots and lots of different um, yeah, resources for um, people to look at. Uh, and this is just the first page of a long list um, that we want to publish in the next weeks um, for people to look at and to add to. And then uh, the last bit I want to be sharing is the uh, self-reflection as slider tool um, and this is um, what you find on the slider tool page and uh, where we also look at the different um, categories of um, the the principles and uh, where we uh, use this tool um, once we start with the mentoring program for people to just reflect back on their own um, making, on their own projects, and where we have the idea that this would be like a 
uh, like a game um, and sad. You created that idea together with a few other people um, also in Singapore to just uh, have um, like a needle to spin and then uh, you don't always answer it in the same um um, like one after the other question, but you can really make it also a little bit more fun. So on the next page, you see um, how this was uh, created also from messy slides um, back back when we, we were meeting in person. And so how it evolved. And on the next slide, you see some guiding cards that should help you to um, actually uh, think about what to ask yourself. Like, how do you think about what makes sense? Or how do you um, think about being self-sustainable? And to, to share a few questions around this. So you, in the end, have like a card game um, that you can have in every makerspace and you can make a workshop around it. and. Um, work with um, other people in the makerspace to, to speak about that. So, and then on the last page, you see um, how to follow the project and how to contribute to it also in the Wikifactory community um, and where we will also be launching uh, the calls on these uh, platforms uh, very soon in the next year, which is basically tomorrow. <laughs> and if you're watching this in January, it's maybe already there <laughs> or in February. <laughs> so now I would say Carl can come back. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, before, now we have a few more minutes for a quick Q&A session. And before we start that, I um, want to remind the viewers and listeners that you can ask questions for this talk um, using Twitter and Mastodon, using the hashtag RC3XHAIN, that's RC3XHAIN. And you can also ask questions on IRC on HackInt using the channel RC3XHAIN. And we already got a few questions in, and um, many of them are asking where they can find more information. So you already showed the link just now. Um, is everything you talked about can be found on there, I think? Not everything is published yet. Um, many of the things I just showed are also still work in progress. Um, and. Um, if somebody's like eager to have it immediately, uh, we can of course share like uh, our internal boards uh, with people. But otherwise, um, we always like continuously um, publish things on the website um, to to find. Yeah. Okay. So the people just have to follow you on Twitter and look at your website and uh, reach out directly to you. Um, then the next question I got here was, uh, what is frugal tech exactly? Do you want to answer, Saad? <laughs> it's an interesting question. I mean, um, if, depending on who you ask, it'll probably get co-opted as a new buzzword or a hashtag, uh, especially if you talk to the VC, venture capitalist sort of world. But the way I see it, is um, um, sort of like borrowing from the disruptive mindset where you look at what uh, is available in the marketplace and find a lower cost alternative for it. And when you look at the assistive tech marketplace, when you work with persons with disabilities and you look at the devices that are available, they suffer from high prices because of uh, supply and demand and you have a fairly small, a relatively small uh, market and the cost of production of a specialized device is quite high. Um, so the products that you find in the assistive tech marketplace tend to be very expensive. And when you look at it, uh, it could be as simple as just like a button, which you just press the button and something happens. And the button itself costs like $65. Um, and it doesn't quite make sense to me that this is a thing, but that is what you will find in the marketplace. So to answer the question, I think frugal tech or frugal innovation is to uh, sort of think outside the box of the normal or, or, or at least the established workflow of, of making a product that is this expensive. 
um, to take the end price or the user perspective uh, as the starting point and then figure out the value chain from behind it um, or the cost of production pr from, from that point onwards. Uh, and in a maker space that happens all the time, you are working with things that you're not entirely sure of. So instead of starting with something really, really expensive, you start with something that is cheap and cheerful, something that you can have lots of. If you break one, it's okay. You can always try it on another one. And then when you're confident with that, you translate what you've learned into something that's a little bit more expensive. So that, I think, approach uh, speaks to, I think, what people are calling now uh, frugal tech or frugal uh, innovation. Yeah. My very short answer would have been uh, that's just low cost because it's the, the easiest I would be able to come up with, but uh, that's way uh, more colorful now, I hope, for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and thank you for the uh, great explanation. The next question we have is... Um, how does uh, this uh, movement or how do you uh, include people who are not that interested in politics or the political side of making and just want to build cool stuff? How do you do that in Singapore? <laughs> well, in Singapore, it's very easy because, you know, the, the political scene in Singapore is quite, how should we put this, um, not very exciting. Um, and I don't really care much for politics either, whether it be like, you know, at the government level or internal politics within large companies. I just I just don't have the uh, mental capacity for wrapping my head around that. So I really like to just do things. And um, I find that with a physical thing, it's easier to talk about something. It sort of crystallizes what your your ideas are, even if the thing is made out of um, post-it notes or cardboard or, you know, cable ties and duct tape. It, it Just having that little physical, tangible uh, prototype um, helps focus the attention on uh, the, 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 the thing that you're trying to solve. So it, the conversation, uh, I find, becomes solution-oriented rather than ideological or process or um, about manufacturing principles or, you know, design ideologies uh, or even political ones. So I find that it's not, I mean, it, it doesn't work all the time, but um, having something tangible uh, really helps to sort of bring that point back to the solution that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, and adding to that, uh, there's always like so many different levels of politics. So maybe you're not interested in uh, global or national or whatever politics, but you're still interested to help your own community uh, around you. So if you look at, I don't know, sensors for um, air quality, or if you look at uh, providing um, free public Wi-Fi for people, or all these things are very political in one way and very non not very political in another way like depending on how you want to look at the, at them so so i think there will be like areas to contribute um, for anyone like whether it's for their own grandma or whether it's for like a whole school class uh, in the end um, it's not so important okay very interesting. So I think now our time for Q&A is almost over. So I want to thank both of you again for having this really interesting talk here at our Ixhain Lichtung stage and uh, want to thank all the viewers for watching. And uh, our next talk will happen in a bit more than an hour at 4 p.m. It's the Cars Radio 247 Reverse Engineering Kochen Nähen Breakpoints. And uh, I hope we'll see you all there. Yeah, Bye -bye. And maybe one ah, last <laughs> tiny <laughs> yes. uh, commercial, <laughs> if you're still there. Um, go to the Open Hardware Happy Hour and also go to, um, on the last day, uh, to the Prototype Fund Hardware Announcements. So don't miss that. <laughs>